I graduated from the University of New Hampshire in 1974 with a bachelor's degree in wildlife and hope to go on to do the kind of work I'm doing today. But unfortunately, I'm dyslexic and my grade scores and test scores were well below par and I failed to get into graduate school. As a result, I went to a, a trade school, a gunsmithing school, and learned the art of gunsmithing. Employed myself as a custom gunsmith and gun designer over 30 years. I met my wife, Debbie, at Colt Firearms, where we both worked in the product engineering department. And in uh, 1980, something or other, <laughs> we, we moved back to Lyme, and I uh, continued uh, doing the kind of thing I wanted to do, started my own shop. But I had a leg up on this kind of work because my father, Lawrence Killam, who was a virologist at the Dartmouth Medical School, studied birds as an advocate and published over 90 papers on bird behavior. I assisted him with that work, and the way he did it, uh, I could do it. It was a matter of making observations, and he taught me how to do good field notes and keeping track of things that you couldn't remember. Them. And uh, I wanted to study carnivores, so my sister Phoebe and I became wildlife rehabilitators, me with the hopes of getting a hold of either a bobcat or a coyote, or perhaps a fisher, the large weasel we have around here. Uh, didn't think about black bears because at the time, <clears throat> there were no people rehabilitating black bears. Uh, it wasn't allowed. And uh, then one day a conservation officer brought us an 11 month old black bear cub that he thought had been hit by an automobile. And it turned out it had not been hit by an automobile. Uh, couldn't climb or stay on a branch. And I wanted to know how, what was wrong with this cub. And uh, uh, the conservation officers came and confiscated it from me very quickly because I didn't have a permit. But later that year, the director of Fish and Game called me up and asked me if I'd take that bear back. And I assured him the reason I wanted it back was to find out what was wrong with it. And uh, we kept, we cared for it until it could no longer care for itself. And we had to euthanize it. We sent the brain out to a wildlife disease lab in Wyoming and got a diagnosis of lysosomal storage disease. The human equivalent of that is Tay-Sachs, caused by inbreeding in the population. And uh, since that time, we've had four more cubs uh, with this illness and we found a lot of, of other congenital illnesses in the black bear population. And this has been caused by bottlenecks in the population over the years. So they, they reflect many of these congenital diseases that humans have. <clears throat> in the 1850s, the forests in New England were largely removed. 85% of the forests were gone. It was open agricultural land grew sheep and, and crops and removed forests. And slowly the forest grew back and the bear habitat came back and the bears came back. Uh, but they came back from a very small group of bears. And on top of that, there was uh, uh, a bounty on black bears uh, until the 1950s. So they were really hit pretty hard. Today, with the forest back, bears forest <coughs> bear habitat is any forested habitat, including that that grows in and around the town of Hanover, which hosts quite a few black bears. Uh, the food supply in Hanover is bird feeders, and garbage, and all kinds of things like that, restaurant waste. Um, so it's a very productive bear habitat. So. Uh, in 2018, uh, we became a nonprofit. And uh, prior to that, our primary source of income was Debbie, who had a full time job. Uh, and in, in 2018, once we became the Kill and Bear Center, all of a sudden we were discovered by lots of foundations that. We didn't even have to apply for grants. I used to apply for grants and get a thousand dollars, and now that people were saying, "What do you need?" and we were able to build a new center. Uh, this is in the, uh, up there now, 
uh, with uh, hot and cold running water, a new cub barn, uh, indoor pens with the uh, heat and cooling in the summertime, small conference room, and uh, it's made a lot of difference. Uh, these cubs are in the cub barn. Uh, last year was an extraordinary year. Last year, the fall mass crop failed. That means there were no beech nuts or acorns. Uh, any cub that became orphaned for any reason showed up somewhere to get food. It was usually in somebody's yard, and the fish and game departments picked them up and brought them to us. We ended up with 137 cubs before the winter was over. Uh, most of them came in in the fall, uh, weighing 10 or 15 pounds, uh, certainly not with enough weight to survive the winter. Our old cub barn, uh, which I was pretty sure we wouldn't need again, I, I gutted it out. It, it, it was pretty well, the bears are hard on equipment. So <laughs> I gutted it out and cleaned it and converted it to my tractor shed. But with a, a surge of bears we got last fall, uh, all of a sudden we were renovating the old cub barn and getting it ready to hold. It ended up with more than 40 cubs in the old cub barn as well as 40 in the one we had just built. And uh, here's another view of the old cub barn. Uh, it's kind of nice. It has staircases to get up to the levels and platforms. And the cubs have good uh, ventilation with the air coming through. And now we're planning to build uh, another cub barn that will be more like the uh, new one that we built, a little bit larger, and again having some indoor space. Attached to the e each of these cub barns, uh, is, one is, has an 11 acre forested enclosure, and the other has an 8 acre forest enclosure. And that allows the bears uh, the ability to climb to eat natural foods. Uh, there's oaks and beech and things like that. Uh, security trees. Uh, the youngest cubs we get are due to den disruptions. Uh, these cubs, well, we got we had some one year that were two weeks old when they came, and they're an awful lot of work. It's like having babies. Uh, every four hours, you have to feed them. They cry when they're not happy, and you get them happy, and they stop crying, and so it goes. Uh, this might be a, a new house going in, and in the fall they uh, clear the property, they build a big brush pile, and in the winter time they want to burn it, so they go in there with an excavator to burn the pile. As soon as they bump it, the mother bear runs out, and same problem occurs. So uh, some years we get quite a few of these. Some years we don't have any at all. Fortunately, this past year we didn't have any, which would have been very difficult with the number of cubs uh, that we did have. This bear was under a, a den under a deck in Vermont. Uh, she came out in the middle of winter. She was badly frostbit, uh, emaciated. Uh, it took three, uh, a week of uh, intravenous fluids to get her even to eat anything solid and uh, she recovered after that uh, and, and we were able to release her weighing over 45 pounds uh, the following June. <clears throat> this guy got hit on Interstate 89 and fortunately had a, a broken leg that could be fixed. It wasn't a compound fracture. Uh, he recovered and was released back into the forest. This cub uh, was la in last year's uh, group. Uh, got this picture sent to us with a bad gash in its belly. And uh, they brought it in and, and it had a bad gash in its belly. Uh, we have at the center, we have a, a surgical room in the basement. This is Walt Cottrell and my nephew Ethan. And they were able to clean up the wound and sew it, sew it back up. And the cub was released in the group of of bears released in the spring. You'll see one of our cubs on the inside and the wild bear on the outside. And uh, there's smells of the wild bears passing through. So they get an education from the wild population as well as 
and interaction with all the bears inside the enclosures. These bears come from many different places. They're not related to each other. The reason our methods work is that I discovered that, that bears are able to make, to make friends and, and uh, uh, cooperate uh, in the wild. They have all the signals they need to show that they want to be friends. So we get a new cub in and within a week's time, he's got a buddy uh, and they're playing and wrestling and everything's going very well. You couldn't do this with almost any other animal. If you took chickens from 10 different flocks, you'd have a bunch of dead chickens in there. <laughs> most, other, most other animals. Uh, same way. So I'm taking this little guy on the first box. Usually walk one or two or three cubs at a time. My nephew Ethan, we've had in some years quite a few bottle fed cubs. He walked as many as nine cubs at a time. Uh, typically it would be the bottle feds, which were be three to five cubs, and then the others would start seeing what was going on and want to go with them. And this these walks are outside the enclosures. These bears can run off any time they want. They also want to be part of the group. They, let, they follow instinctively, so we don't have to teach them to do that. It's something they do all by themselves, and they definitely don't want to be left behind. So here they are uh, in, a, in a green field, wrestling. I was walking uh, the first sets of cubs that we had, and I was documenting everything they did. I wanted to know how they responded uh, to the natural world. Uh, when I read the literature at that time, uh, it said that a five-month-old cub could survive, and so they were releasing uh, rehab cubs that should have been in rehab, releasing them back into the woods at five months old. And I wanted to know why they were so smart when a mother bear needed 18 months to get these cubs to survive. So I documented all of their response to the natural world in my book, Among the Bears. It's pretty much a story of that time walking cubs. And I saw uh, they go up to a tree and be attracted to bear scent and their tongues would come out and stick to the scent. They lift the scent off the tree, but bring it back to a small bump behind their front teeth it's called the papilla of the vomeronasal organ. The vomeronasal organ identifies new scent, and then the cubs were able to learn to smell that scent from that vomeronasal organ. And uh, we went throughout their home range, uh, take them out for nine hours at a time. Uh, they would show me bear scent and sign that I'd never see without them. I could, I could recognize a footprint on leaves, things like that, which is impossible with the knowledge I had. And I thought at the time that there might be two bears in line, and I found out there were considerably more bears in line, and this was almost 30 years ago. And uh, I found that bears liked bears, and the bears were all attracted to the cubs. I had a very little, a uh, very small enclosure. Uh, it was. I couldn't keep the bears in it, so I'd lock them in it and I'd head for my truck and give me time to get out of there. They'd unlock the locks and be on their own. <laughs> and they'd stay in a two-acre area until they were about 
six or seven months old, well, actually more than that, they were, until they were about 10 months old. They wouldn't leave that area unless I arrived and then they followed me out and they were comfortable uh, going anywhere with me and then coming back to that spot. Uh, so uh, this is what I, what I did. I wrote about, as I say, in my first book and what I learned in my second book. One of the bears that I worked with, uh, and it's been in all my books and all my films, is a bear named Squirty. Uh, she came to me as a three pound cub, six weeks old. Uh, I followed her into the wild and put a radio transmitter on her. Uh, she had two siblings, so I knew what happened to them. And uh, Squirty has established her own home range. She's had daughters and granddaughters and great granddaughters that she shares that home range uh, with. Uh, she shares it with the matrilinear hierarchy. Uh, Squirty is now 27 years old. I continue to see her. Uh, here's a picture of her earlier this summer. <coughs> She's a big, strong bear. Uh, She's been the boss bear of that entire area. Uh, she is no longer giving birth. She gave birth to 23 cubs, uh, but she's gone into menopause, if you will. Uh, so matrilinear hierarchy is, is relatively simple. Uh, this is Squirty. Her oldest daughter, SQ2, a younger granddaughter, SNLO, a younger daughter, Brooke, another granddaughter, Two, and the sub-adult, SQ2LO. Squirty on site will chase all the bears below her in the higher. And for them to stay, they have to obey her rules. They have to be compliant with her. And the number two bear will chase all the bears below her. Number three bear will chase all the bears below her, and everybody chases SQ2 alone. <laughs> the result of that hierarchy is that Squirty will have access to the highest quality foods, have, a, have the best quality home range, and she uh, will get compliance out of all those other females before they're allowed to use part of her home range. If they don't, they hit the road. <laughs> but it's a, it's a rigorous uh, process. Uh, the, uh, oh, incidentally, in 2015, I got my PhD at Trexler University at age 65. And uh, just so we could write up some of the things I was finding, and this was the first published paper out of my thesis on matrilinear hierarchy. Um, so it's, it was nice to finally get it in a journal, which believe me is an awful process. <laughs> it's even worse when you're dyslexic and don't know how to handle these characters. But I'm slowly learning. You've come to find out reviewers, you have to answer all their questions, whether you like them or not. And reviewers often think they ought to be authors. So it gets even more complicated. The young males that came into my study area were quickly uh, chased out, sub-adult males. In this picture, Squirty's going after a grandson. I watched this little guy get chased more than 30 times, not only by his grandmother, but by his mother, by his aunts, and any other bear that could get a target on him. By September of his second year, he left the greater home range and joined the population of male bears in the upper valley. Here is SQ2LO uh, as an adult chasing a male bear. I'm going to sound in this one. Okay. Chasing uh, a male bear out of uh, the home, out of my study site. The females cooperated on was chasing males out of the female home ranges. Females need high quality home ranges because their cubs have short legs. The males can go anywhere to find food, and they usually go to places where there is an excess of food and don't have to compete with females. So here she goes.
the large males that came into my study site, and I'll take a moment to explain my study site. It's on a piece of property that Debbie and I own. It's about 400 acres. It's a mile from uh, the nearest town road, half mile from the nearest residence. Uh, it's, uh, I go up there every evening. I provide a small amount of food to any bear that shows up. I go up there every day from the time the snow leaves until it returns in the fall. And I'm, I've been documenting social interactions between bears. I've documented more than 1,500 social interactions, which is the basis of my thesis. Uh, it's, it's interesting that they all like to have lots of observations. And I had more than enough uh, to do any of these things. And uh, the, the males that do all the mating are the 300 pound plus animals. We only see them in the spring when the breeding season is going on. After that, they seem to disappear. Uh, and, and when the breeding, breeding season is over, the males would stay around and take food from the females because of their size. They could take food from wherever they wanted. But the females only tolerated this so well. And in this slide, Squirty weighing about 180 pounds is going after a 300 pound male and asking him to leave. And the males left. And this suggests that there is a degree of female choice in mating because if there wasn't a repercussion, these large males would stay and take food from the females and their cubs in these female ranges. The big surprise in my study was there was a number of unrelated females. And all everything that I'd ever read was that unrelated animals wouldn't get along. It would only be the related animals that would have relationships, um, family relations, family relationships. Well, it turned out uh, the bear on this side, a bear we call moose, when Squirty was a yearling, I released her into the wild with her two siblings. She, one of the three had radio collar on them. And I walked them up to the top of the ridge. I had a remote enclosure. And uh, they marked all the way up. They marked all the way back. I locked them in their, their, their pen. And just like with the other cubs, they broke out. In the morning when I got there, they were on top of the ridge. And I went up to see what was going on. And normally, if I got uh, close enough with my radio, I could tell how far away they were. I could just call them. They'd come to me. But on this day, they ran, and I knew that something was coming, going on. I suspected a wild bear because the first set of cubs that I'd raised had mixed with wild bears at that age. And the next morning, I decided to sneak in on them. I had the wind right. I caught them feeding in a beach stand. Uh, I was doing pretty well until I stepped on a large stick and broke it. And that's the alarm call for all wild animals to run. And my two cubs ran in tree. And before I knew it, this wild female, who I call Moose, came running over and false charged me. She false charged me, defending my cubs from me. <laughs> and then finally, my scent got up to my cubs. They recognized my smell. They came down. Each one of them came up to greet me, nose to nose, like bears do. Then they pinned their ears and bit me on my forearms, uh, letting me know they weren't happy about the interruption of time between <laughs> themselves and this wild female. Meanwhile, she sat on the bank about 50 feet away watching everything that was going on. But ever since that time, Squirty has allowed Moose and all her female relatives access to my study site, which uh, Squirty controls. And Squirty controls an oak ridge, uh, and Moose and her clan control about 23,000 acres of beach. So in a year when there's acorns and no beach, Moose and her clan come on to Squirty's home range. There's very little interaction, negative, aggressive interaction between them. And in years when there's no acorns and only beach, Squirty and her gang are allowed to go on to Moose's home range. This is reciprocal altruism. It's basically what we do. It's our, our form of social behavior. 
<coughs> which means it's a tit for a tat with a time delay. <coughs> and in the case of the female bears, the time delay can be as much as a year. Uh, so it's the same as your neighbors inviting you over for dinner and you feel obligated to invite them back over for dinner. You're not inviting them back over for dinner because you're nice people. You're doing it because it's in your genome. You don't, you feel obligated to do that. And these things uh, developed in our development over the years. It's the kind of thing they've been looking for in the great apes, but never found. Great apes are group social. They live inside of fixed territories. And uh, the black bear, uh, as I say, it's able to make friends with strangers. And the culture in the black bear is shared very rapidly. It's harder to identify than uh, tool use that they found in the apes. But tool use in the apes and, and uh, culture in the apes ends at the boundary of those, uh, those, those chimpanzee colonies. Whereas the black bear, if they learn new information, it travels rapidly through the population. Uh, we've had a number of instances where we raised cubs and they, they went and they were gone for two months, came back, and they knew all kinds of things. They knew how to build nice beds out of leaves and how to wrestle. And they often, Phoebe had one cub, Phoebe's my sister, uh, had one cub, a single cub, and uh, he had let her know that he wanted to stay out. He stayed out for three weeks. When he came back, he had a 200 pound friend, a male, who followed him right back in the enclosure. So we've seen an awful lot of interesting things with these bears. And uh, the, the other thing about this uh, unrelated females is the Squirty already showed me how she managed her, her matrilinear hierarchy. And she's pretty hard with her family members. She chased them up trees, she got compliance, she punished them if, if they broke any rules. But with these unrelated females, it was nothing like that. Uh, there was hardly any aggression between them. And she essentially let them come in, and uh, there wasn't any uh, hierarchy with uh, the unrelated females. And there was a huge parallel with humans, because after all, we're harsh on our family members. We're harsh on our friends, uh, our, well, our family members and our relatives. And we're harsh because they're our closest cooperators and communicating with them is terribly important. And we can get away with it because we can always reconcile with a family member. But you never go up to a stranger and rank them out the same way you would a family member because you might not be able to reconcile with a stranger. But they are a cooperator and they might be important in your survival sometime in the future. So these bears have a lot of parallels uh, that reflect on human behavior. And we certainly pay uh, for people to get over chasing the apes and pay some attention to black bear to learn about how humans became human. <clears throat> the male's social behavior was harder to study. Uh, annual home range of a male can be as much as 200 square miles. Uh, the males generally share food in concentrated uh, food areas. Uh, I set up, I noticed that in, uh, after a logging, when the blackberries were ripe and the insects were around, there'd be an extraordinary amount of bear sign. I went in there with <coughs> cameras and I set them up and put a small pile of corn and replaced them, I replaced the corn every time it was gone. And I quickly filmed eight or 10 different males and the resident females. And this, this site was happened to be one that was just about out of berries and, and then the insects were waning. And uh, so when I first set my cameras up, I got the eight or 10 different males. The next year, only the resident female was there. The males had all moved on to another source of, hot, of, a, of a lot of food. But the big surprise with the males was I have an awful lot of pictures of two males sharing that small amount of corn. Now this isn't reciprocal altruism, it's done at the same time, there's no time delay, but it is mutualism between unrelated individuals. Now of course, 
they've shown this in some films and they've all speculated that these were related animals because they wouldn't share or travel together if they were unrelated. So I did the DNA of the bears in my study area and found the males to be unrelated. And I found, uh, I also done the DNA of the females, which females were related and not related. So th this is mutualism uh, between unrelated individuals. And uh, this is like, you know, going down to the bar with your buddies and sharing beer. Uh, it's not a lot different. All of this is about the access to food. And in the spring of the year, uh, normally there's leftover nuts. This year there weren't any. Uh, so the bears were eating green vegetation. Uh, you see bears at the ed edge of agricultural fields of eating nodding sedge in the woodland trails. Uh, these cubs are climbing a red oak tree and eating no leaf starts as the leaves break out from the buds. All of this greenery has about 16% protein, uh, but it lack, lacks the, the starch and the, and the fats that you find in acorns and, and other of the hot and or sugars that are in the berries later on in the year. So this year the bears were hungry uh, around the state. Early on they were getting into trouble, uh, but now the berries are ripening and the trouble's lessening. The bears are moving back to where they're supposed to be. This is Squirty's daughter, uh, SQ2, meeting her mate for the first time. You'll see the difference, size difference between the two. Uh, this is called sexual dimorphism. Uh, the females put all their extra energy into reproduction. And the males put all their extra energy into growth. Males have to compete to mate, so size means a lot to them. And you'll see that she's a little aggressive with him. Uh, she's aggressive with him because she hasn't met this big guy before. Uh, she's been busy raising her cubs. And he's calm and collected. He's been out, down, wandering around. He knows exactly what to expect. Calm down. He'll follow her and finally catch up to her. All that uh, aggressive behavior was pre courtship behavior. Uh, it's normal in bears. It looks very aggressive, but it's it's what makes it all work. Uh, that aggression and finally he catches up with her, grabs her with the forepaws, bites her behind the neck. All that aggression and the bite behind the neck helps stimulate the female to ovulate precisely at the time of conception, which ensures that uh, babies. Babies are born in January uh, in the winter den. Uh, the females will give birth to one to three cubs in normal situations. <coughs> the cubs will be, uh, once they're born, they'll be raised in their mother's fur and kept warm through the winter months. And finally, uh, they'll, uh, in April, uh, she'll move to a good uh, climbing tree and she'll coach her cubs the very first times they attempt to climb and once they're able to climb and follow she'll start leaving that site and that's usually about the middle of May that coincides with deciduous leaf cover. Bears are very conscious of cover and so once there's a good cover they'll start moving around. Bear is black which is the background cover so they can get behind one bush and disappear 
which is a great advantage. And then here's a sow and her two cubs. Uh, she'll care, they'll continue to follow her throughout the summer and fall. They'll den with her as yearlings and the following spring, uh, the family breakup will take place. Uh, Scordy's granddaughter is removing ticks from her yearling son. And a week later, once she's made it, uh, she becomes the till of the hunt. <laughs> Here she, here's another female chasing her yearling up the tree. And every time the yearling thinks about coming down, she'll run back up the tree. Uh, I watched her run up that tree nine times in 10 minutes. And uh, it doesn't take long with this kind of stuff uh, before family breakup is accomplished. Uh, it's very abrupt. Eighty-five percent of the black bear's diet is vegetative, and uh, ten to fifteen percent is animal protein. And of that animal protein, ninety to ninety-five percent is ants, bees, and grubs. Uh, so bears are not true predators. Uh, they're they're opportunistic predators. They don't respond to movement or sound in the forest like a coyote or a bobcat might. Uh, but they will take advantage. Of of animals that are wounded or slow. Uh, and unfortunately, uh, chickens are one of those animals that's uh, rather slow. Uh, one of the biggest problems we have uh, in, the, in the cubs that come in is people shooting bears at chicken coops. When a simple electric fence with bait on it will keep bears out of almost everything. By bait, I mean <clears throat> keep smell on the fence itself, and keep it fresh and you want them to come up and sniff it or lick it. And once they've been zapped on their, toe, their tongue or their nose, they're not interested in what's behind that fence. It's highly effective and it works. Some are vegetative. Uh, the summer foods in the black bear are, are vegetative. They generally grow in wetland or wetland soils. Uh, they're uh, jewelweed or a touch me not that grows in everybody's yard, several species of wild lettuce, and jack in the pulpit. Jack in the pulpit has a root or the cor or a corn uh, that has um, more nutrition than either beech nuts or acorns. So, in a year like this, when there are no nuts around, the bears will feed heavily on jack in the pulpit. Uh, we, <clears throat> it's a problem when the best jack in the pulpit grows between houses. And I remember when I used to chase bears down here in Hanover, between Low Road and Next Road, I forget which of that was, but it was all jack in the pulpit in there. And when there was no food in the woods, the bears moved in to eat jack in the pulpit. And then, of course, they find a bird feeder or two in the process. The average bear needs to put on 30% of its weight, body weight and fat to get through the winter to hibernate. A female bear giving birth to cubs needs to put on 50% of her body weight and fat to get through the winter, give birth to cubs, and have reserves to nurse them in the early spring. So if you want to know why a bear acts the way it does around food, just think about how we act around money. We, we get all the money we can, we put it in the bank, <clears throat> to, put our, to fund our retirement, to put our kids through school, or to buy a fancy boat. And so uh, you wouldn't go home tonight and scatter $100 bills all around your neighborhood and have the expectation that nobody would pick any of them up. And that's the expectation we have uh, when bears show up on our deck and we've got a bird feeder out there. A tube of bird seed. Black oil sunflower seed is 20,000 calories. So just think of the draw that is. And our, 
know, uncontained garbage is that food is about 10 times uh, the value of any of their natural foods. And it all has a smell. And to control bears, you control smell. If they can't smell it, they're not going to be a problem. So if you store your garbage in a container or a shed, the wind blows through, they're going to tear it open to get to it. Store it in your basement or a sealed garage, you won't have a problem. <clears throat> The natural foods the bears need to fatten up and reproduce. <coughs> Get some water. In New Hampshire, are red oak acorns and beech nuts. <laughs> Both of which failed last year. Bears use a number of different types of dens. <clears throat> this is an excavated den dug, up, dug under a, a, the roots of a tree that had blown over uh, previously. When I crawled in the den and looked up, the ceiling of the den was a matrix of live roots that prevented the soils from collapsing down around the cubs and the other during the winter time. <clears throat> They use rock dens, and often the entrance of these dens is very narrow and small, even though bears are our size. They have very supple shoulders and flexible backs. And they can wiggle down into the rocks in places where we can't go. It's not unusual for us to see a bear in a den, maybe even sedated, but then pulling it out to change a collar can be difficult. We've got a cooperative project with me. With New Hampshire Fishing Game, where we keep GPS collars, and we try on 10 different females, uh, and uh, sometimes changing these collars and these dens can be difficult. Here's a yearling bear with its mother in a rock den. And the last type of den I'll talk about are tree dens. Uh, and these trees get to be about three feet in diameter. The center of the tree can rot out, leaving a huge cavity. There's an opening the bears will use these to den in. One morning in April, I got a call from a woman. She said, in Lyme, she said she had a, woman, a bear in her tree. And when I got there, sure enough, she had a bear in her tree. I informed her the bear had been in her tree all winter long. <laughs> With the complex social behavior I described, bears have complex communication. And in this picture, Squirty is uh, Exhaling, she exhales and uh, moist air into the air uh, from her breath and draws back in scent. Uh, that uh, male bear in that video was doing the same thing. Uh, one of the first things I discovered about the bear was they have a special organ, they have the vomero nasal organ, which I knew about, but they have a, an accessory to the vomero nasal organ that. I discovered and coined the Killam organ, and it, it lays in the vomer, which is a V-shaped bone. It has a sensory organ that comes, a sensory nerve that comes down to the roof of the mouth, so they're able to hold a leaf in their mouth and determine whether it's edible or not. They can also determine if, it, if another bear has touched that leaf, they can determine who that bear is. But there's also a bundle of sensory nerves that go up the vomer under the brain, and spread out over the roof of the throat so that any scent that comes in through their nose or mouth gets the bone or nasal reading and they're able to identify uh, who those bears are and uh, those puffs are coming. I noticed that the bears at my study site would get react to a puff of scent and react emotionally as though they knew the bear they were getting the puff of scent on. Bears have emotional expressions. Any social animal has to have some form of emotional expression and facial expression. Uh, as humans, we have most complex facial expressions of any mammal on earth. We have 3,000 muscles in our face devoted to expression. Right now, everybody in the room has a neutral look on their face, something I call subway face. 
<laughs> anywhere in the world you ride a subway, you'll see that expression. But if somebody were up to something in this room, that would also be written all over their face. And they wouldn't be able to hide it. We'd all know who that person was. We wouldn't know what they were up to, but we would have a good idea who it was. And so in this picture, Squirty has just put one of her cups up a tree at, at winning time. She has eye expression, eyebrow expression, general facial expression, and ear expression. When her ears are pinned, they're like those of a horse or a deer uh, that, show that, that show that she's aggravated. And in this picture, she has a happy face. Now, a lot of people come up to me with their bear stories and tell, tell me about the bear they saw. And I say, well, what did it look like? And I, the answer I usually get, it was black. <laughs> Bears also have a, uh, an expression of intention. And I get in trouble with some scientists because they say that only humans have expressions of intention. But that's not true because we both can communicate with strangers. And those expressions of intention arise out of the communication with strangers. Communicating with strangers is far, much more dangerous than communicating with just family. So bears have to be able to meet another bear they've never met before and, and communicate with them. And here they, they chomp their teeth, they huff, they swat, and they false charge. Bears do a lot of bluff charging. Uh, it's based, you can read, uh, the meaning of it is based on the context of the situation at the time. At the time. Uh, they rarely charge unless they're breaking up with their cubs or something like that and they're putting them up a tree. Uh, they have no reason uh, to go after humans. Bears are afraid of humans, uh, but they will bluff charge if they're pushed. And uh, I have some video of bluff, bluff charge. Uh, the first one is squirty, and the context is the National Geographic came and wanted to film Squirty for the day, and Squirty decided after 15 minutes that was enough, and this is Squirty telling the film crew to pack their bags and go home. Right. Film that 10 feet away from her with a handheld camera. <laughs> I've been false charged thousands of times. When I go out into the woods with Squirty, uh, I was using her time. You know, she needed that to survive and to raise their cubs. And when she decided it was time for me to leave, often she just bowed in my direction, a very subtle uh, signal that it was time for me to go. I wouldn't get an aggressive false charge like this and there, unless there was a stranger involved. And then i have broken one of her rules by letting strangers uh, break that trust that we had between us. Uh, but they got the message, they left. <laughs> <laughs> now again, this, this false charge um, comes in a number of different uh, intensities. And in this ne next film, uh, Scordy's granddaughter, Wanda, who likes to false charge a lot, you'll see the difference in intensity and then she'll walk right up to There's a transparency uh, about bears. I told you they could judge and punish. Squirty uh, uh, had, was able to have her own home range and get the best quality food. So if Squirty found an oak tree that had more acorns on the ground than any other oak tree, and then she decided that was hers, she would back rub on the sapling and let all the other bears know that that was her spot, and they worked to mess with her. And if another bear came and took some of those acorns, 
she could pick up their trail and track them down uh, for 48 hours or more in exact punishment. And the bears, uh, the transparency in bears is extremely good. They follow each other to punish and follow each other to find food. And I often use the example of somebody uh, putting a bird feeder out and a bear comes and they get all excited. They call their neighbor up and put the bird feeder back out and want the neighbor to see it. So they invite the neighbors over and sure enough, a bear shows up the next night. And they keep doing that. Meantime, the first bear went three miles up on the mountain, left a black well sunflower seed scat. The next bear comes along, finds that scat, says, hmm, I wonder where that came from. Picks up the trail of the first bear, follows back down to the backyard where the bird feeder was. And within a week or two weeks, you could have eight or 10 different bears coming into your yard. Bears, if you go to the cornfields around here, there's trails radiating out from the cornfields. Uh, every one of those trails uh, picks up any bear that's going by. And they pick up the trail and they funnel right down into the cornfields for the food. Bears naturally advertise big surpluses of food. And you'd find the same thing on salmon rivers and dumps or any other place where bears are attracted to food. <coughs> Stop this one. This uh, next video, <clears throat> this is Squirty's daughter, uh, SQ2, uh, trying to pick up that transparent sail, uh, scent of her mate. Uh, male bears will be with females for a while, then they'll get distracted and run off after another female. And uh, She wants to reconnect with, the, with her mate, so she's picked up his transparent scent and she's marking over it. You'll see that it's male because she has to stretch up the tree uh, to pick up all of this scent. And then she'll do uh, a stiff-legged walk. She'll mark with urine. Stiff-legged walk uh, leaves a mark on the ground that he'll notice. And finally, she'll walk over a sapling depositing scent. But all this message says, I want to meet back up with you. <laughs> over the sapling is picking up the scent, flips back up like an olfactory antenna. So these bears are very busy socially in the forest every day. You know, if they come to our backyard, we just think there are deer in the headlights back there. But they're constantly communicating with all the other bears in the area, and they know all the other bears in the area. Uh, they're not solitary animals by any stretch of the imagination. Another video. Let me, let me talk about it. Sure. Uh, this video is, uh, again, I talked about intention. This is uh, Squirty's granddaughter, Wanda, and with two young cubs. There's a man, there's a bear approaching that she's alert to, and she's trying to communicate to him that danger is coming. Uh, they're too busy with the food, and they're not listening to her. She's trying to get their attention. You'll see that she gestures towards them, trying to get them to follow her and follow her away. They don't do that. Uh, and then she comes back, she gets more aggravated. She starts gulping, which means she wants them to listen. And 
Uh, she gestures more. She wants them to go up a tree. She nudges them to go up a tree. They're not listening. And uh, finally, it's not until the bear gets within view that the cubs catch on what mom wants. And then they run up the tree ahead of her. And then she starts chomping. The bear will be at the base of the tree. And by the, this is active teaching. And by the end of the summer, these same cubs listen to everything that mom has to say. When she gulps and walks in a certain direction, they'll go in that direction. When they're up a tree and she wants them to come down, she'll sit at the base of the tree and gulp and they'll come down. If she wants them to follow her in a certain direction, she'll walk in a certain direction and they'll follow. So this kind of uh, uh, communication is not only uh, body language, but also vocalizations. Parents with cell phones <laughs> trying to communicate the dangers. Uh, <clears throat> this is a red pine mark tree, and this time of year, the male bears will be marking on these trees. They'll back up to them, their paws will come out, they'll flex their knees as they rub the forest, on uh, they rub the uh, sebaceous oil from their back into the forest bark of the tree. These oils are, uh, don't have much smell, but they're long lasting. And then the females will come by and find the male they want to mate with. Uh, they'll mark on the tree and wait nearby. And then when he shows up again, they'll get together and they'll leave the area. And then they'll travel together. Uh, here's a 300 pound male traveling with a female, marking over another male's scent. I started working with another kind of bear. <coughs> I was invited to go to China with a scientific delegation that was talking about the effects of climate change on panda habitat. I was the last speaker with a group of scientists speaking before me, and they all gave very scientific presentations. I gave a presentation just like the one I've just given you. And when I was done, who Rong, who's the director of science and research at the Chengdu Panda Base, came up to me and she says, we noticed your talk was quite a lot different from the other talks. <laughs> and then she said, you make us think. And the next morning I was hustled off to the Department of Forestry that manages the wild panda population and the, na and the nature reserves. I gave the same talk again. They were very excited. And then we came back and I came back to New Hampshire, and seemed like forever, but I think 12 years went by. We didn't hear anything from them. And then I was summoned back to China. They had some questions, and they wanted me to present again. And the questions were that if we try to walk pandas like you're walking black bears, won't they just run off? 
and we'll lose an animal that's worth millions of dollars to us, both in, mostly in, in tourist money. They draw well, hundreds of thousands of tourists, of tourists to Chengdu every year to see pandas. <clears throat> and if they try to have a bear like Squirty, an adult bear, well, the wild pandas come and attack them. And so they were coming to the Drexel University to the English Learning Center, a delegation of them, quoting Haram. So we invited him to come for an extended weekend in line. And uh, we had six bottle fed cups at the time that I took for a walk on the hill up behind the house. Uh, they mouthed veg vegetation and ate it. They found a hornet's nest. Then we took them to a red pine mark tree, still had scent on it. All the cubs got very excited, climbed the tree, came off and did that funny stiff-legged walk and marked with urine. And Hurong got very excited. She says they could communicate with the wild bears without ever meeting them. And uh, that evening we took them up to my study site where Squirty came out with her cubs and se several other wild bears showed up. No bears attacked the truck. And they had a seven hour ride back to Philadelphia. They talked the entire way. And two months after they got back, we started the panda reintroduction program at Chengdu. We selected our first panda. And then uh, IMAX did the story, which is uh, called Pandas. Debbie has copies of uh, DVDs that played down in Boston in 3D. That was really the way to see it. Uh, in 3D, they shot some scenes in New Hampshire. There's in the vernal pools in our enclosures. And of course, we have mosquitoes. And in 3D, those mosquitoes came right out into the crowd. <laughs> <laughs> so that was quite entertaining. Uh, but uh, it tells the story of Chen Chen. And Chen Chen uh, is still alive. She's about eight years old. Um, they're still, you know, it's, it's disappointing to me because uh, the Chinese and most Asians don't take very many risks. They're risk averse, which means that they're not going to do what I did with the black bears. Um, they're going to think of every reason not to do it. And, Chen Chen should be in the wild. They should be putting three or four panda cubs back into the wild and find out what the problems are and what it really takes to reintroduce these animals. And you only do that by having failure. Uh, we've already learned the first male panda that was released, well, both of them, Chen Chen and her brother uh, or her mate, um, both got attacked by wild dogs. And uh, we were able to identify the problem. We did studies on the cameras to find out how deep into the forest that the, bear, the dogs went. And we found that the, even though they said these uh, areas that were supposed to be natural reserves, uh, there were so many uh, square miles, were actually very few square miles if you cut out the perimeter that the wild dogs could get into. And so since then, uh, they've made strict laws about dogs and neutering dogs. And the other problem with dogs was they weren't vaccinated, and the pandas didn't, there wasn't any vaccine for the pandas against distemper and other diseases. They made huge gains, and uh, one would think from that they would continue to take a few risks to learn out the rest of the problems of having a good wild panda population. I'm thinking, Ben, I'm just looking at the time. It's I'm, about. I'm ready for questions. Uh, what's that? I'm ready for questions. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I'm just thinking we've got some kids in the um, audience here. Um, and and um, it, I don't want to rush you, but it's about 10 of, 10 of 8. So. All right, well, let's take some questions. If they have questions, they go first. Yeah, thank you. Does anybody have any questions? Yes. Ben, will the male bears kill the cubs? Very rarely. No more than you know, male humans kill 
babies, and it's usually because for the same reasons. Yes. Can I ask about a bear visit I had? Uh, if it's a story, let's stick to questions first. Okay. Later on, we we'll talk about it. Yes. So early on in the movie, Squirty is um, sh showing off the the young males while she's got her other female family around her. Is it to your point? Is it be why were they? She was done with them. She'd already raised them. They should have been. No. Or will they, they do try to for genetic diversity? Say that again. For genetic diversity, okay. the, ma the males all go into a dispersal. The females stay home. So they would have tried to mate with their own genetic family. Yeah, okay. they don't have an opportunity if they're driven. Away. Got it. That's kind and of. That's why when we did the study on the male population to find out how much trouble was there, it was they're pretty much unrelated. So even that is embedded in their genomic. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Well, you, you know, everybody thinks that wild animals are, it's all innate. Mm -hmm. And, you know, humans are somehow different. But everything that makes us human is innate. <laughs> and, then, and then we go to school and learn mathematics and, English <laughs> and stuff like that. Then we have a question on Zoom. Okay. Um, Tina wants to know if you what should I do if I encounter a bear while out walking? You know, encounter a bear while out walking um, and um, enjoy seeing it. Uh, if you have a dog, have your dog on a leash. Uh, dogs are the one thing that can cause troubles. If a dog chases a bear, the bear may chase the dog and bring the bear back to you. And that can be a problem. Generally speaking, if it's a sow with young cubs, and she false charges you, hold your ground, keep your eyes on her, and talk softly. Always de-escalate a situation. Talk to her like you're talking to your dog or your kids. And they're smart enough to read them. Thanks, man. Yes? You talked a lot about Squirty's rules. Have you found Squirty's rules to be different from the rules that other individual bears have? And how did you learn her individual rules? Well, I wouldn't have even had a window in the rules if I hadn't been working with her. I found that she had rules for me as well. There were things I couldn't do. And one was interfering with her social engagements. I didn't have a free hand. I was often trying to video things and stuff like that. And if she didn't like what I was doing, uh, she might bite me. And after you get bit a couple of times and then you go, well, I probably shouldn't do that again. And I and I realized that she was doing the same thing with her offspring. So the, the rules were very clear, punishment was clear, and, uh, and yeah, she has rules. I write about all that in the books. Yes? How big can a male get? Well, <clears throat> The males in this state, the biggest ones are over 500 pounds, and, but they're generally, uh, have spent their time on the landfill and they're what, known as belly fraggers. <laughs> <laughs> but if you go down to New Jersey, there's one on uh, uh, Interstate 84 at the visitor center that was 750 pounds. He was five years old and his head is huge. It was just a one huge bear. Go down to North Carolina, the coastal population, uh, some of those males are up to 800 pounds. Wow. So it's all about food in the black bear. We don't have the highest quality. We only have one species of oak. Uh, we have white oaks, but not many of them, and beech nuts. But you go further south, there's multiple species of oaks, and, uh, higher quality. The reason I ask is we've had a huge, beautiful, just jet black, shiny male bear come. We had blackberries close to the house on the side of the driveway, and he just come down and help himself. And he was I just enormous. I just was curious. He was, he was probably uh, pushing 300 pounds. Yeah. 
they, they, they're big. Yes. You mentioned a couple times that you had been um, nipped to be taught a lesson. Um, have you ever had an interaction where you were concerned for your safety? And was it with a bear that you had fostered for quite some time, or was it with a new interaction? Well, the, the only bear uh, that I've had ever been bit by or had any concerns about is Squirtle. <laughs> because I raised her, she treats me like a bear. They're, and all the other bears, all the wild bears are intimidated by me. So they're not a concern at all. All I have to do is take a step towards them and they're one in the other direction. But when you raise an animal, they know exactly what they can get away with. And they think you're a bear. You're family. <laughs> Yes. Where, where, where does your research and work go next? What is the, what is the next sort of frontier in, in sort of understanding uh, the bear? Well, my next frontier is trying to get what I've discovered published. And that's, uh, I don't know, my lifetime is long enough for it. It's pretty arduous and painful. Um, but I, I, I have enough now for data and everything for about 30 papers. It should get out there. And I'm dealing with um, you know, reviewers and you know, the last paper we set out on communications went uh, to a journal that had wildlife biologists involved with it and they didn't like the fact I had a study site where I studied uh, fair, and, which didn't make any sense because Jane Goodall had a study site where she studied chimpanzees and it goes on and on and on. We had plenty of examples. They said, well, in this modern technology, you can use camera. Well, I can tell you something. Cameras don't show you what you can see with your own eyes. You can't see the social interactions. You can't see the chases up trees. You can't see the chases out of the area. And uh, then the other thing, you know, they, they worry about the risk. You know, I've walked with Squirty for miles. I spent all day out and she'd be tracking another bear and finally catching up with her and treating her another female and establishing dominance. And, uh, they would say that's too risky. You know, they, wildlife biologists just love uh, telemetry collars, and GPS collars and stuff like that where they can all do the same thing, put them on a sedated bear and then watch and look at the data from you know, I've been, my study's been going on for 30 years. The average study goes on for the length of the graduate school, which is two years. <laughs> so, you know, what I've learned is far greater, and uh, I'll probably end up writing another book just to get more of it out there. Well, that's all we have time for, Ben. That's all. Um, we look forward to your third book coming out. <laughs> so um, thank you so much for coming. We really appreciate your, your time and all your um, amazing stories about your life with bears. So. Um,